Hi, I'm Mark Kennedy. I'm a columnist at the Chattanooga Times Free Press. Today we're going to take a tour of the building at 400 East 11th Street. Come on inside. On the wall as you come in is actually the words of the First Amendment, which are sort of the foundational um, ideas that create a free press and free speech. And it's something that it's good to remind us every day when we come to work or when we greet visitors that this is what it's all about here at the Times Free Press. Let's go inside. There's not many people here, but we've got the place to ourselves today. So most people, when they think about the newspaper, they think about the actual paper product. This is what we call the broadsheet. This is what lands in people's driveways all over a 28 county area now. Um, but we're much more than that. This is a media company that has products beyond the Times Free Press paper. For instance, Chatter is a lifestyle magazine that we publish each month. Chattanooga Now um, has been suspended during COVID, but this is a weekly publication that lets you know the events and fun things to do that are going on around town in any given week. Get Out is a quarterly publication that is about the outdoors, which is increasingly part of our local economy, and all the tourists that come to town to do paddling and mountain climbing and all the fun stuff. Flypaper is a um, web marketing and optimization company that's become a subsidiary of our operation here. Edge is our successful business magazine that comes out once a month and features profiles of top business people and companies around town. And then the Community Weekly is a uh, full circulation product that many of our readers see on their driveways because it comes as a free service to lots of neighborhoods in the city. Let's go in and look at some of the old equipment that marks the history of the newspaper over time. Some of the equipment in this area is almost 200 years old. This is a piece of equipment called a platen press. It reminds me a little bit of an old sewing machine. This kind of mechanical action that you see here where these two plates inside here come together and press um, paper against inked uh, words is called letter press. And this was one of the original ways that people did printing. This was actually never used here at the Times Free Press because the technology is so old. But we have it here just as an example of what it was like almost 200 years ago to create printed products. Moving sort of on a timeline, this is called the Washington Hand Press. Many of you may have heard of the Gutenberg Press, which was one of the first printing presses that was used in Europe and uh, printed some of the early Bibles and is responsible for a lot of the, the first sort of printed word. This is, mimics that technology and it actually was used here for a time. This is a copy of the Constitution that was printed on this press and this is the raised relief plate that uh, allows it to be printed. I'm told that this was actually used as a proofing tool at one point, that um, pages were put here and proofed so that we could make sure that the spelling and grammar, punctuation, all that was correct before it was actually put on the printing press. But that again was many years ago. As we move our way around here, I'd like to tell you about two people who are really important to the history of the newspaper. This bust up here um, is a representation of Adolf Ox. Now this was a, an image of him in his later years, but he actually came to Chattanooga as a very young man. At age 19, he came here, I think from Knoxville, and originally maybe from Kentucky. And he borrowed $5,000 from a bank and purchased the Chattanooga Times, which was a small fledgling newspaper at that point, and was here for about the next 20 years and built it up during the late 19th century when it was really in its early growth stage. Then Mr. Ox went to New York City um, over 120 years ago and purchased the New York Times, which we know today is one of the like, leading international newspapers in the world. But at that time, it was very small, it was even failing, and he borrowed some money and purchased it and created sort of a new model for journalism um, to give the news impartially without fear or favor is the um, slogan or logo on the New York Times. And it, was, it flowed from Mr. Ox's idea that the news should be objective. It shouldn't um, show favoritism toward one or uh, the other political sides. It shouldn't be uh, representative of business interests over workers' interests, things like that. It should be impartial and give both sides. I wanted to show you here Mr. Roy McDonald, who is one of the other patriarchs of journalism in Chattanooga. Mr. McDonald 
was the patriarch of the Chattanooga Free Press, or at points it was called the News Free Press. For many years during the 20th century, the, the morning Chattanooga Times, owned by Mr. Ox's family, and the afternoon Free Press, owned by Mr. McDonald's family, competed in the market. And the news reporters vigorously competed for news breaks and tried to get the best of each other, and I was part of that early in my career. And um, only in 1999 did these two papers merge into what we call the Chattanooga Times Free Press today, um, which is both those papers put together basically, which happened in 1999 when we were consolidated into Waco Media, which stands for Walter E. Husman Media, which is a media company out of Little Rock, Arkansas. Moving on around here, this is an important piece of newspaper history. This is called the linotype machine. You might have heard the term hot off the presses. Well, that comes from this technology, which actually set type in lead. Now, we know now that lead is sort of toxic to human beings and probably wasn't safe to be around. And indeed, a lot of people who worked on these machines ended up getting lead poisoning. But nonetheless, for many decades, this was the way newspapers were put together. As you can see, this is a keyboard. Um, where the linotype operators would sit and actually type in the stories. And then in the back of the machine was hot lead that would set the words into type, create lines, which would then be put onto plates, which we'll see in a minute, which were put on the press to create the newsprint. This is a photograph of what it actually looked like. This is a teletype machine. Before the internet, and I know for some of our younger uh, viewers, that's uh, you know before you were born, but this is the way that we communicated around the country and shared news. If you look inside this machine, it actually has paper tape in it. So this machine was connected to telegraph wires. Uh, you may remember telegraph technology was the way people sent messages to one another over wires. And actually the news was uh, disseminated that way as well by wire services. That's where the term wire services come from, from the wires that connected these machines. So, say back in the 1940s and 50s, news would have come across on this tape. It also could be disseminated from Chattanooga, from this terminal. So, let's say there was a big breaking news event in Chattanooga that was worthy of national news coverage. Someone would sit down at this keyboard, type out the news, and it would be sent over wires to uh, AP offices all across the land. So. Behind these machines here, this is a photograph of a printing press that was operational here in this building for many, many years. It had a nickname Big Red, and it was one of the first, maybe the first color press that was ever installed in a Chattanooga newspaper. You see the workers, this was probably made in the 50s or 60s, they still have their overalls on. Before the tour is done today, we'll go through and look at the current press, which is three generations uh, beyond Old Red, and we'll take a look at how the technology changes uh, over time. So before, there were cameras on everybody's telephones, and way before we even had telephones in all of our pockets, there was uh, photography like this. If you can see in this glass case, the negatives of these photographs were actually printed on glass plates. These plates were found um, sort of off in a corner uh, a few years ago and we have revived them and put them on display. Some of these photographs go back to the early 20th century and depict uh, events around the Spanish-American War and just in general shows you how far photography has come. This is the type of camera that would have been used um, in the first half of the 20th century to take a lot of the photographs that appeared in the newspaper. One interesting fact about this, though, is I'm told by people who really understand this process that there's more detail in these uh, negatives than even in some modern digital photography. In other words, you can take these plates and you can enlarge the photos uh, to a great extent, even more so than a pixelated picture that you might take with your camera, which was news to me. So these are the plates that used to come off the old linotype machine that would be affixed to the printing press, spin at really high speeds, and transfer the ink to the paper. One of the interesting things about these is that they had to be heated to 550 degrees in order to shape them into this semicircle, which meant to be handled, they had to use really um, thick gloves, otherwise they would have burned themselves, which was quite common among pressmen back in the day.
Now we're in the newsroom. This is where about 60 journalists and editors work every day to put the newspaper out and also to staff our um, internet product, our website, which is a 24-7 news operation. We're really proud of our work here at the Times Free Press and so are evidently our peers in the state of Tennessee. One of the things that we, is a particular pride point for us is the fact that all these wooden plaques here represent wins in the State Press Association for general excellence, which by another name is the best newspaper in Tennessee. We win this on a point system, and I think we've won at six of the last seven years, even though only five of them are represented here. Um, and that's in the large newspaper category, which would be against other cities like Nashville, Knoxville, and Memphis. So we feel like uh, among our peers, and we're the smallest city in that group, but we have been recognized as having the best newspaper paper product over the last decade or so, which is, is extremely gratifying for us. Um, we also have a history of doing well in Pulitzer Prizes. The newspapers in Chattanooga have won two over time. One is for this photograph here on the wall, which was taken in 1976, I believe, by Robin Hood, who was a former free press photographer. The story behind this photo is this gentleman was a veteran. And it may be hard to see through the camera lens, but he's a double amputee. He's lost his legs in the war, and this is his child. And uh, the interesting thing about this is they're watching the Armed Services Day Parade, which is a yearly celebration in downtown Chattanooga of all things military. So this would have been back in the 1970s. There's an interesting sort of anecdote about this. Evidently, the day after the parade, this didn't appear in the newspaper, but the photographer was so insistent that it run that he went back to the desk the next day and said, you know, please, let's get this in the paper tomorrow. Had it not published in the paper, it wouldn't even have been eligible for consideration as a Pulitzer Prize winner. In more recent times, we have scored um, a runner-up status in the Pulitzer several times in recent years for editorial products that have come out of the newsroom and for Clay Bennett's cartoons. He's our uh, uh, um, cartoonist that works on our uh, editorial pages. Uh, he's been a finalist many times and actually won a Pulitzer Prize before coming to the Times Free Press um, a decade or more ago. We're about to enter the Times newsroom where about 60 journalists and people practicing all sorts of uh, journalistic crafts do their work every day. As you notice, it's almost empty because everybody's working from home and remotely uh, during these COVID times. But before long, this is going to be a lively place again where people are exchanging ideas, shouting across the room, typing uh, on their computers stories for the next day, doing photographs and so forth. One of the things I like to tell um, young folks when they come through on tours is to consider that there are a lot of different jobs in the newsroom. It's not just reporters and editors. For example, one of the big jobs is page design. Throughout the newsroom we have examples of really nice page design that are put on the walls. And if you can see here, people who like major in college in graphic arts, publication design, are often the people who fill these positions. This just happens to be a page that was in the life section Back in 2013, I told you I was a columnist. This is actually a little baby picture of me right here that says my column is inside on that day, which is kind of funny. One of my favorite photos that hangs in the newsroom is the picture of these two ladies because I think it represents the First Amendment at its best. These are two people on a street corner who, if I read this right, have opposing views. <laughs> And so the lady who's using the bullhorn um, is being answered by the lady who's grabbed the bell of the bullhorn. But to me, it just epitomizes what free speech is about and how we live in a country where we're able to do that and also to have a free press to represent um, and write stories about this kind of happening around town. We have with us now Allison Gerber, who is the editor of the newspaper. Allison, we just thought we'd stop by today because the newsroom is empty and let you tell us about what it's normally like and how much the newspaper is committed to uh, a robust news staff. It's usually a very lively place. There's lots of conversations. There's a lot of collaboration. Newsrooms are places where, um, you know, you can tell by the, the space, it's very open. So it, it's sort of designed and built to encourage conversations and back and forth and we have a team of um, around 55 people which is the largest new staff in the market and um, I think that the fact that we have that many people in our newsroom really really uh, tells our community how committed we are. I like to stop and point out this map on the wall because I think it um, 
it shows a lot about how things have changed and improved over time. Back when I was a young reporter, I hate to say this, but way back in the 1980s, a map like this was a, an essential tool for a reporter. If we were given an assignment and told sometimes to rush to a particular scene of a news event or spot news as we called it, we would have to find the address and then come work to the big map and try to locate it or pinpoint it. There used to be a book that was tied to the wall that had the coordinates on it and then we would look for that and then try to find it and point ourselves in the right direction. Now of course we use uh, GPS mapping apps, everyone has a phone, nobody has to deal with this anymore but this reminds me every time I walk by it of what it used to be like when we didn't have that technology at hand. This is a room in the new, sort of off the newsroom where we memorialize some of the best photography that's appeared in paper in the paper over the years. Um, we used to at the end of every year have a page of the best feature photos which is sort of the soft news report and the best hard news photos as well and we would put them on a special page and run them in the newspapers. I like to bring tours in here and just talk to them about some of the images and the different moods they create because there is a, a lot of difference like for instance this photo in the upper left hand corner here um, this is a family who's lost someone in a war setting uh, and is dealing with the grief that comes with that. Um, that just is sort of grips you in the heart. It's hard to look at that photo without feeling um, empathy for those folks and the, the intense emotions that they're feeling. But the, the newspaper also just has slice of life photos like this photo of the two ladies getting their hair done and the little girl in the middle. It always just makes me smile because it's so typical of what everyday life is like and it captures it in a millisecond. But it's important, I think, to capture those, um, you know, those important sort of lifestyle events that happen to all of us. So I'm here with Chris Vass, who's the opinion editor and the public editor of the newspaper. And she's going to tell us about a unique feature of the paper in that it has two editorial pages. Chris, why is that? In 1999, when Walter Hussman merged the two predecessor papers, the morning Chattanooga Times, the more liberal paper, and the afternoon Chattanooga Free Press, the more conservative paper, he made a pledge to Chattanooga and the surrounding community that he would maintain both independent editorial voices. Uh, he believes strongly uh, that a strong community uh, relies on divergent opinion, uh, a place where different ideas can be explored and debated, and having both a conservative editorial opinion page and a liberal editorial page is one way to accomplish that and encourage community discussion. Through this door is the press that produces the print version of the Times Free Press. This is always sort of a moment of drama in the tour when I take children through because they've got this anticipation about what the press looks like. And it is quite a piece of machinery. It's four stories tall and there's even a, uh, a section of the press that's below the ground floor where the paper is loaded on. We'll take a look at that too. But right now we're going to walk in and we're going to be looking sort of a bird's eye view of the press looking down on it. So this is the press room. As you can see, it's not operational right now. It generally is being used for about three hours a day when the newspaper is printed. As the day gets later, there'll be pressmen in here who will be attaching plates onto this press that will represent all the pages that uh, will appear in tomorrow's newsprint. So here we are now under the press. This is where the giant rolls of paper are loaded onto the press that spool up into the main press and that's where the printing happens on the floors above us. The interesting thing about this newsprint is that it's harvested from trees that are specially planted for this purpose. We don't just go out and clear a forest and you know cut down a bunch of old growth trees. These are trees that are cultivated specifically to become newsprint. It's almost like a crop. And as soon as the trees are cut down, more trees are planted on top. We use about the equivalent of about 100,000 trees a year to print the newspaper and tens of thousands of dollars of ink that goes on the paper to create the color photographs and the print that you read. Over time, the business is shifting some, obviously, so more of our readers, a bigger and bigger percentage, are actually seeing the paper online and going to our home site and our web app and our phone app to look at the news. So we're in sort of a period of transition, but many, many thousands of our readers, in fact, the bulk of our subscribers, still get home delivery of the print product. And this is where it all starts. 
So here we are in what's called the mail room, even though there's not really any mail going on here. It's the place where the inserts that are in the physical newspaper are actually placed inside the paper. Even though it looks kind of deserted right now, as we make this tape, it's just a few weeks till Thanksgiving, which is our busiest day of the year and our biggest crew of the year will be in here inserting inserts into newspapers. The papers come off the press, which we just saw on these conveyor belts, and they come off so swiftly that, you know, it's, it's many copies per second, actually, that find their way in here. And the staff of folks that work here, you know, process the papers, bundle them, and then ship them out through the loading dock, which you can see in the far background, onto trucks where they're delivered to our three-state circulation area. Thanks for joining us today for our virtual tour of the Chattanooga Times Free Press. We hope you enjoy seeing what it's like to look inside the, uh, the inner workings of a business that's 150 years old. Please check us out on timesfreepress.com and follow us on social media and subscribe to the newspaper.